uh, credibility in a conversation you told me we are in the middle of, of a crossfire. Uh, in the literal uh, term of the of the sense, but also in terms of reputation, of course. Um, so, how do you practically actually deal with this question of credibility? Uh, and just to um, uh, to provide some element, I remember uh, I, I went to a, to an exhibition in Kiev in February, and Anna also you you advised me to go there. It's an exhibition organized by volunteers, you know, the most active uh, Ukrainians engaged in solidarity with the front lines. And it's, uh, it's an exhibition about war in Donbass with different artifacts and photos. And you have one photo of OSCE, which is really revealing of the popular perception, and especially by those groups of active people of OSCE. You, you see a situation of war on the picture, and you have just a car, OSCE car. You have a guy sitting in the car, the door is open, and he just has put his legs, you know, in a very relaxed way uh, on the car. So that's the image, actually, of OSCE. Thank you. Uh, great issue on, a uh, great question on, on credibility, and it's crucial. Um, first of all, there's, a, there's the obvious issue of uh, people with agendas um, and the need to have what I'll call, what has been called, gatekeepers in the flow, the tremendous flow of this information who curate the data, cross-check the data with a number of other different sources, and especially those that maybe don't have a vested interest in the outcome. Um, reputations in this field are very fragile, and the better sources, the ones that I showed you here, most of those were from Bellingcat in the UK, uh, whose repu despite the fact that they're under constant attack by Russian trolls, which goes without saying, um, you, if you follow the commentary, there are critiques. They do, it, <clears throat> excuse me, adjust some of their findings from time to time. But you just have to get a sense, <clears throat> pardon me, of what the, the the level of technical expertise is. Uh, and once the reputation is damaged, they're pretty largely finished. So, to some extent, it's self-policing. I guess is is what I'm saying. Yes, hi. Yeah, of course, the issue with reputation is an important one, and it's, uh, we do actually, yeah, of course, we face these kind of images for both sides, so, <coughs> and it's been, yeah, and it comes sometimes more at certain times than others. For example, I, I mean, I actually, interestingly enough, I've seen the same images used on both sides. <laughs> like there was one of us as kind of blind monkeys, I think, also. And, and I've seen it in Donetsk, and I've seen them later on on the internet from Ukrainian sources. So I think this is uh, something that we have to battle with constantly. I think, in my view, as long as they're equally from both sides, I feel that then, okay, so we are doing something right as well. Uh, but of course, I mean, the issue of uh, contact with the population is an important one, the one that we are also now seeking to to deepen, and it's, it's also been, you know, it depends, a lot of the time we've been, uh, the monitoring has also been constrained by security reasons, so the level to which you have the access to actually go and speak to people has sometimes been quite difficult. Uh, we try to also through the media strategies to, you know, to kind of deal with some of these things. Uh, for example, we also had a lot of uh, attacks on, well, on Twitter, on other media campaigns, so, and I think the other thing, we, I mean, Sometimes when it's when it's dealing with facts, then we have to try to kind of come come up with the factual issues and show you know actually this is not the way <laughs> it's been portrayed and try to show it through those kind of sources. But I, I think it's just something we have to continue working on. Yeah, I'll just mention again, <clears throat> very very quickly. Um, there are ways to digitally investigate imagery, mm -hmm. reverse image search to find out where the image originated and also ways to find out if it's been manipulated, if it's been photoshopped or whatever, the pixels have been moved around. Uh, and there are folks out there, believe me, who are on that job all the time, trying to figure out what's real and what's not real. Do you think that these new technical possibilities are just a window of opportunity or something more uh, permanent? What I'm thinking of is, this selfies issue, uh, Russian soldier selfies. As soon as uh, Russian army authorities realized that selfies were kind of uh, geolocalizing uh, soldiers, uh, they stopped. 
they were forbidden to do them anymore. So as soon as you publish this kind of information based on non-official open open data, the, the, there is a risk that this kind of data could be blocked. So what, what is your point? The selfies issue <clears throat> is a sources and methods question, and that's why intelligence agencies protect their sources and methods, because once you know that somebody has that capability, you take steps to counter it. The word is that after the ISIS command post was blown up by a GPS-guided bomb, that ISIS told everybody to ditch their phones. Uh, and uh, uh, the, the point about the Russian soldiers is a little bit spongier, that uh, it, it really does seem to be um, something that they can't let go of. Um, and uh, beyond, beyond that obvious one, then there's the ubiquity of smartphones amongst everybody. So you don't necessarily have to rely on selfies. You get, I mean, you can track the Russian involvement in Syria almost in real time now. You could watch them load onto the ships and move the cargo to Syria. Then you watch them fly the airplanes in and line them up on the ramp. And then you watch them begin to launch sorties. I mean, you have all of that sort of thing playing out in the public domain almost in real time. And if there's somebody out there with a video going, it is real time. Uh, and that capability is so new and so incredibly uh, revealing that it's literally created a new situation for governments that hitherto, as I said before, have been, what, reluctant to release the information that they have. So now you don't need them. Uh, you have a lot of information. What are the relationships with the Ukraine government? To what extent do you share the information of, of your monitoring to the uh, with the Ukraine government? Is it yeah. total, uh, complete, partial? I mean, we share, actually, so it's quite unusual for us. We, we share the, the information, actually, publicly. So every day we issue public reports, which is also why we have to be very careful with how it's being, that we have it accurately. Uh, and of course, I mean, we do, uh, and uh, I mean, we, we do monitoring on, on both sides of the contact line and you know sometimes when we monitor when we report something on the Ukrainian side also they don't always like it so then they will contact us and you know but we have a we have a very good relation with the government we, we have a good dialogue with them if there's any issues we, we normally discuss it with them quite frankly and so we try our best but of course we have to you know our, our I mean all the reporting we do is public so um, I think uh, one of the like for, just to take a concrete example now with the uh, with this withdrawal of weapons uh, where actually I mean the Ukrainians have actually given us much more information and time but in, initially we faced the problem of getting you know the baseline information both for the smaller weapons and for the, more for the heavy weapons and whenever we don't get the information and whenever there are ceasefire violations whenever you know we don't when we get stopped and uh, don't get access to go into certain areas. We do always report on it. So in a way, I mean, we see that both, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, we see that Ukrainians, re they read them very carefully. The same with the guys from the DPR. I mean, they read the reports very carefully also. So if there are issues, they, they bring it up with us and then we have to.